Welcome to Insiders, I'm David Spears. In what could turn out to be Australia's worst peacetime military disaster in nearly 20 years, a Taipan helicopter ditched in waters off Queensland on Friday night. Four crew were on board and while the focus remains on finding them, big questions are already being raised as to why the Taipan fleet was still in operation at all. The crash served as a powerful reminder of the dangers faced by those in uniform as Australia prepares to expand its military capability. The Prime Minister will pay tribute to the crew members when Parliament resumes tomorrow. But then it's back into the political contest. Anthony Albanese is threatening an early election next year if the Senate won't support his promised housing fund. The opposition, meanwhile, will continue its attack over the cost of living. At least there was some better news on that front during the week, with a further easing of inflation, dampening expectations of another rate rise. Coming up, I'll be joined by the Social Services Minister, Amanda Rishworth. First, our panel, Greg Sheridan, Amy Ramikas and Jennifer Hewitt. I want to start with inflation and that somewhat better news we saw during the week. We'll take a look at it. Inflation eased down to 6%. It's come off the peak, as you can see, in, uh, in December. So it's heading in the right direction, still too high. Jennifer, what's happening here? Why is inflation coming down? Well, you know, of course, during the worst of the COVID era, we all got used to the concept of supply chain disruptions. Uh, and those things have eased and the fact, you know, everything's open again now. Uh, so that means that the cost of goods, which really did go up a lot um, because of uh, shortages, uh, that's, that's easing a lot. What has not eased so much and which is what the Reserve Bank re remains worried about is services inflation. And, and you'd see, you know, things like rents going up uh, incredibly, uh, insurance. Insurance is going up incredibly, even you know, whether you go and get a haircut. And that, that is reliant more on the cost of labour and it's more domestic. And that is the issue that's still a bit of an, a, problem, a concern for the bank, so we'll see what yeah, happens. Yeah, and it, it did note that stronger wage growth, this was the ABS, noting that stronger wage growth, increased costs for utilities, rents and so on, insurance premiums are contributing here. So that's the services uh, inflation you're talking about. Look, obviously Jim Chalmers was happy to see some improvement on the inflation front and he was... He was putting it down to what he's calling his three-point plan to tackle inflation. Yeah. Firstly, uh, banking a bigger surplus to take some of the pressure off inflation. Secondly, providing cost of living help to take the edge off some of these pressures rather than adding to inflation. And thirdly, focusing on and investing in the supply side challenges in our economy as well. That is our three-point plan for combating this inflation challenge. And, of course, he didn't mention interest rates. That, interest rates had a bit to do with it too, right? <laughs> yes, and that, they're the short term. Yeah. It, well, they, they ha of course, they take effect over a long time as well, but they also have a very immediate effect on, on people's confidence and on inflation and on spending. So that is actually the, the main reason why inflation is coming down. All the things that the uh, government is talking about, the Treasury is talking about, are much, much longer term yeah. at best. What do you think, Amy? Is this going to change the debate much over cost of living, this bit of better news? No, not really. Right. Is it still going up? Still going up and we're still in uh, a world of pain for the yeah. next couple of years at least. It's it's not going to be a, a drastic fall uh, and because of things like rent increases and stuff, people are really struggling and that's one of the reasons why the Greens argument is so potent and I know we'll get to that later but uh, yes, labour costs are, in, uh, are labor Labor is going up in some cases, but not across the board. Yeah. And there is a cohort of people who are paying for the rest of the country at the moment to try and bring down inflation well, and yeah. a cohort that's not really making much change at all. And that is just widening inequality. Yeah, the rent is an interesting point. And we're going to come to the you know, um, back and forth over a double dissolution election. But rents, I think, in these figures show the biggest increase in something like 35 years. So we're talking about a generational spike that's going on and really hurting uh, renters um, right now. Part of the better news, though, on inflation, although I need to keep pointing out, still a long way to go, was electricity prices. We saw uh, also during the week the figures on electricity prices. We can bring those up too. Um, you can see the big spike a year ago in Q2 of 2022, and then right at the end of the, the list there is Q2 2023, the second quarter of this year. It's, I think, the second highest Q2 on record, but it's come a long way down from that big peak uh, 12 months ago. Um, and the energy market operator is, is happy about that, confident that things will improve from here. But, Greg, it's still, uh, you know, it, it's still an increase in electricity prices. Inflation is still going up. All of these things are still putting a lot of pressure on people. Well, that's right, David. <clears throat> and um, 
let's be clear, Australia's interest rates are still below uh, the nations we compare ourselves with, Canada, the United States, Britain, America's and so on. America's just put up again. Yeah, I think interest rates will go up again, and uh, I think we're still in for a world of hurt to come. The unemployment rate is artificially low, and probably lower than, than is really consistent with full employment. Uh, the terrific column from Christopher Joy uh, in Jennifer's publication of the weekend showing there are so many cross currents. You know, there are a classification of uh, mortgages which are in really deep trouble. At the same time, a lot of folks, my generation, have loads and loads of money that they saved from COVID. Mm. But um, the bottom line is we are, we are basically the economy of Saudi Arabia, the politics of California and the living standards of Switzerland. And there are certain <laughs> contradictions there. Jim Chalmers only has a surplus because Russia created a boom in commodity prices through the war. And um, these, these are not... The combination is not I, I sustainable think, yeah, for the, the stronger jobs market has helped that surplus a lot as well. And, and look, it is interesting, uh, th this point you make about, you know, does the unemployment rate need to be higher? And this is kind of what the new Reserve Bank governor has, has said previously as well. But in the US and here, Jennifer, we're seeing unemployment still remain at these very low rates of 3.5% in both countries. Inflation is tracking down could it be that we are able to have the best of both worlds? Well, I think uh, all economists and certainly all journalists should be a little uh, cautious about being too predictive yeah. uh, about uh, given all the shocks and, and uh, unexpected things we've had. Yeah. Uh, but it does seem as if um, in the US, for example, uh, a lot of people didn't go back into the workforce. At the same time, you've got um, demographics, you know, an old ageing population. So that all of those things... Um, do make a difference. But it is also true uh, that nobody is, has been quite expecting the resilience um, of the of the uh, unemployment rate, uh, or of, of the employment market, actually. So, uh, I, but I still think in, in economic terms, there doesn't seem any doubt that uh, eventually wages we'll track uh, uh, will, yes, that, and that unemployment will, will that the, the popular term the government likes to use, I notice, is rather than going up, they're little, they keep saying tick up, it'll tick up. Um, and uh, that presumably doesn't excite people quite as much as, uh, say, the Reserve Bank saying things have to, the, the unemployment rate has to come up a bit. But on, on Greg's point also, energy prices. Energy prices are only going to keep going up. This is, this is going to be a continuing problem for the government. Of course, they are a bit lower, much lower than they were at the crisis last year. And one of the big reasons for the crisis was that many, so many coal plants were out of operation. Yeah, they're back online Well, guess now. what? Yeah. You know, that's what we're supposed to be closing down. Yeah, look, AEMO, the market operator, said it's, it's because of that. The coal plants are back online. Coal prices have come off, but also much more renewables coming into the system. So they've said it's kind of three things going on that's, that's helping, but uh, still more, more to come. Look, the Prime Minister Friday uh, announced that they will reintroduce their housing fund bill. This is the bill for the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, they're pulling the one that's currently before the Senate, sick of the Senate saying, um, well, not passing it. Uh, so reintroducing it could set up a double dissolution trigger uh, for the government. Why, Amy, is the PM doing this? Uh, partly brinkmanship just to force the Greens to try and come to the table and just put the pressure on them to say, hey, if there's an early election, it's going to be your fault. Um, and partly because it's pretty handy to have up your sleeve a uh, double dissolution trigger. I mean, Malcolm Turnbull managed to conjure one up. Uh, but it, so it didn't... Well, I guess he did get re-elected <laughs> in that one, but he lost a lot of skin in that Well, campaign. I did. And, I mean, like, it's all going to depend on timing. There's the voice referendum as well. And if the render re referendum goes down, I don't think you're going to see Anthony Albanese say, yes, we're going to go to an early election. But if he feels a way that he can consolidate uh, the Liberals' downward trend, that he can maybe get uh, a few more Labor MPs in the, sen in the Senate or in the House, mm. uh, and that he can kind of get rid of the stage three tax cut parts that no one particularly likes, there is a chance that he will do it. That's an interesting idea. But look, what, what I'm being told from Labor is they reckon at a double dissolution where you dissolve the entire Senate, not just half the Senate as you do at a general election, uh, they think they'd pick up an extra Senate seat in Victoria an extra Senate seat in Queensland and potentially one more in New South Wales. Um, but it's, it's a lot of things have to go right for that to happen. What, what do you both think, Jennifer, on I the prospects of an I, early election? Well, of course, every government likes to have it as a, as a possibility, but I don't think there are any prospects of an early election. I think this is all a bluff. People do not like early elections. Of course, there is some unbelievable crisis and, you know, and, and sure. shock. It, anything's possible. But, in but general... what about late next year or even very early 2025, roughly 
when an election would be due anyway. So then, then it's not you, early. It's, it's just not no, early. It's but, but it's a double, double dissolution. dissolution. And is there an advantage for Labor in having a double dissolution rather than a general election? Well, well there, there may be, but I mean, the fact is that it, that means it's easier for all sorts of independents to get elected mm. as well. Um, at the, the expense Senate, of the, the Greens, government. though. Maybe at the expense of the Greens, but it, it also means you've still got a very unwieldy Senate. To me, I think that's a very big chance to take. Maybe they will. Well, uh, yeah. I, I think it's completely a bluff because electorates all over the Western world hate early elections. Theresa May called an early election. She was 25% ahead in the polls. She ended up in minority government. But I also think... The Campbell point... Newman's a great example in Queensland too. Absolutely. Uh, had this huge yeah. record Yeah, there was a lot going on I, I with Campbell Newman. I also think Newman, that, so. that Amy's point is absolutely central. If the voice referendum is successful, Anthony Albanese is the greatest constitutional reformer in Labor history. He is a folk hero without equal and he can do almost anything he likes. If the voice fails... Peter Dutton is suddenly legitimised. You can't call him a racist because he'll have the majority of the electorate with him. And Albo becomes the man who started with 80% support for The Voice and managed it so badly that it lost. So I think everything in Australian Rests politics on hinges on what happens in The Voice. Well, on this issue of the housing fund, though, these threats and, you know, maybe it is a bit of bluff, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be shifting too much, uh, uh, forcing the Greens to shift uh, too much. Here was Max Chandler Mather on the prospects of a double dissolution. I think if they were going to go to the public and they said, we would rather go back to an early election than spend a few extra billion dollars on public and affordable housing, I think the public would look on that very poorly. Now, look, Amy, it's worth pointing out, the Greens, in holding out as long as they have so far on this, there has been some movement, right? Mm -hmm. You had the, the government tip in an extra $2 billion back in June. Dan Andrews in Victoria is now thinking about, talking about, consulting on rent caps and freezes and so on. Queensland's got a review of their rent controls going on. So the, the Greens um, feel like there's momentum here. What do you think they'll do? They're signalling that they're just going to hold the line on this. Is that going to cost them, do you think? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a moving feast. I don't think that anyone can say what they're going to do. We've just had a weekend of them door knocking and Labor electorates across the nation talking about this particular issue. And they are right that the momentum is with them because the consequence of not having housing policy in this country over the last decade is you have more people renting for longer, potentially for life now. And we do not have a rental market that is set up for people who are long-term renters slash life renters like you do in America or New York or so. And and so there is a lot of people who are just saying, this is my life now, I cannot be at the whims of a market because investment housing is apparently the only safe bet where you have to have a profit or you have to have somebody else making sure that you always come out in the clear. You don't have that on the stock market or anything else. But that's how we see renters. They're just people. They're just collateral just to pay other people's mortgages. Yeah. There needs to be a change. Governments are slowly cottoning on to that fact. But with the demographic shifts that are happening in this country they're not doing it fast enough and this could be the linchpin that starts to see a bit of a tip in the favour of rental market changes. The, these are largely for the states to, to they control these rent uh, issues and there'll be a national cabinet uh, coming up before uh, October or in October where this is meant to be discussed um, but in the meantime as, as the Prime Minister points out he's got this bill on the table to actually deliver some money for housing and you've got all these housing groups lining up with him shelter and so on saying come on greens pass this we need to get these houses built i mean but it's such a marginal policy it's such a marginal policy it's a, it's a bit like defense policy there's this fabulous debate over something which will have no impact or almost no impact the big crisis in housing is not one of regulation to favor tenants you could do a bit of that it's a supply side problem you, you can't zone land, you can't build new houses. What you need is a classic Hawke Keating supply side reform to enable thousands, hundreds of thousands more houses to be built. I mean, tinkering at Canberra with an investment fund which may on returns allow them to invest a tiny bit of money I mean, to help... They, they, they point out it's not the only thing they're well, doing. Well, it's not the only thing they're doing, but it is, it's 30,000 houses over five years. Now, that is 6,000 houses a year, and they're also saying at the same time they want a million houses over five years. It, it, so Greg is right. It is absolutely tinkering at the edges. doesn't mean it won't be, you know, useful, but that's kind of all it is. And it, it is basically a supply-side thing, which is a lot to do with state 
state governments and, and local councils and all of that uh, reluctance to, to allow those um, greater density in suburbs. But bottom line, is it better than nothing? Well, of course it's better than nothing, but I think for the Greens, of course you've got community housing groups saying, we want this, but they're not, they're not really talking to them. They're talking to voters who are renting, and I think that's why differentiating themselves from Labor is kind of quite useful for them politically. All right. Well, time to talk now to the Minister for Social Services, Amanda Rishworth, about another measure coming before Parliament this week, the job seeker increase that was announced in the budget. To take us there, here's a reminder of why the government said it could only afford to give those on JobSeeker an extra $40 a fortnight. We've got to look at this uh, whole uh, issue and make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, within the constraints of the budget we inherited from the former government that had a lot of waste, had a lot of mismanagement, uh, So, but we are getting on with that job right now. We recognise that people on payments are doing it tough. We've also got a budget in deficit and a big debt burden to manage, and so we have to balance up a range of competing priorities. We'll assess it at budget by budget um, and if there is room in the budget of course uh, that that's ha how we have to deal with a whole lot of competing measures. Well we've done what we can afford in this budget. We've tried to be as responsible as we can recognising that people on job seeker are doing it particularly tough. Amanda Rishworth, welcome to the program. Great to be with you. So your plan to lift the rate of job seeker by $40 a fortnight as announced in the budget uh, we know but there was also meant to be an indexation increase on top of that and you've been waiting for the latest inflation data. Are you able to now confirm what that increase will be? Yeah, our policy designed for the increase of JobSeeker made it very clear that the $40 would be applied before indexation. It's due on the same date as our increase on the 20th of September. I'm able to confirm that that rate will be $56. So JobSeekers over a fortnight will get $56 right. extra. Um, in addition, that extra indexation will also be applied to our Commonwealth rent assistance um, that uh, we announced in the budget. 15% increase on the maximum rates and uh, inflation applied after. So the support that people will get through that if they're on the maximum rate will be, be between 18 to 37 extra dollars a fortnight. OK, so just on JobSeeker, the $40 plus 16 from indexation, what... What, how does, what's the rate of that indexation that you've, you've settled on? The, the rate of indexation is being calculated at 2.2% um, for the, the preceding six months from January to July. So only a 2.2% increase in indexation. How, how did you arrive at that figure? Well, that's what the CPI figures are for the six months. Obviously, a job seeker is indexed every six months. So in March, there was a 3.7% indexation applied. Um, so right. there's been two indexations. But importantly, we didn't uh, do the indexation and then add the $40. The $40 right. was incorporated. So the full amount, including, a, including our increase to the base rate, has been applied. So we're looking at maximising uh, the support that people people do get. I'm just wondering, that indexation rate, even if you put the two of them together, um, you, you're only getting to around 6% over the year. A lot of basic costs for people on JobSeeker have gone up more than that. Uh, in fact, we can show you some of them here. You can see over the 12 months, uh, food and non-alcoholic beverage up 7.5%, rent 6.7%, gas more than 22%, electricity more than 10%. So is what you're doing enough? Well, firstly, uh, that is the indexation, but we've increased the base rate of JobSeeker as well by 40%. But that's not the only uh, cost of living measures we've taken. As I said, Commonwealth rent assistance, the largest increase in Commonwealth rent assistance that goes to 1.1 million Australians will benefit as a result of that. We've got our energy price reductions, which will focus on concession card holders, and of course, our our tripling of the bulk billing incentive, which is focused once again for those on the lowest incomes, those that have children. So you've got to look at these cost of living uh, measures in their entirety. So the, you've, you've just announced the job seeker increase will be $56 uh, and the Commonwealth rent assistance, which I think was a 15% rise, was it in the budget? So that will be a bit more. That'll be. That's correct. What's the. Uh, at inflation, so 17.2. Uh, OK. What about some of the other payments, like single parent payment and so on? Have you worked out those figures yet? Uh, well, uh, we haven't worked out those figures. Some of the other... Uh 
measures like pension and single parent right. payment has a, a choice of indexation measures, so we've got to work through those indexation measures. Um, uh, but CPI, of course, is uh, uh, particularly high at the moment, and so it is likely that CPI will be the highest uh, of the, the number of measures that are looked at. When you uh, were making this decision in the budget on the $40, um, you set up a group called the Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee, brought together uh, business unions, social security experts, economists and so on to give you specific advice on this. It recommended lifting the job seeker rate to $875 a fortnight, 90% of the age pension, they said. Just remind us why you said no to that. Well, of course, the Economic Inclusion Committee was uh, providing a very specific advice on the level of job seeker um, to inform the budget process. Of course, the budget process has to take in a range of different factors, including uh, a responsible structural adjustments, but also, of course, as uh, uh, the Treasurer has said, making sure that we're not adding to inflation. So there is a lot of issues that we do have to weigh up in a budget process. The economic so just to be clear on that, you couldn't afford it and, and you're worried about pushing up inflation? Well, well uh, there's a number of uh, aspects that were considered in our careful calibration of the budget. But are they the two reasons? Well, there were a number of factors considered in uh, why we would uh, increase, for example, okay. job seeker, but also rent though. assistance, uh, also restoring single parenting payment. There are a number of actual uh, issues we addressed. Our focus... I'm just though, trying to ask what those are, well, and well, it's affordability. Our focus, our focus across the board of our budget was helping particularly those doing it the toughest. If you look at... Uh, we are providing cost of living relief across the board, but of course those doing it toughest was where our focus was I'm on. Just so that's what guided us. Why you couldn't do what your experts were asking you to do. It's because you couldn't afford it, was the answer. Well, there's competing different viewpoints, but of course the budget is one of those. Budget considerations is one of those. And we carefully calibrated in a number of areas. Rent assistance being another area. Uh, of course, the single parenting payment. Now, that was not a recommendation necessarily from the EAC. It was a recommendation from the Women's Economic Task Force. So we had uh, advice coming in from a range of different areas. And I think areas. they were all saying go beyond where you did. Um, but obviously you your argument at the time was, uh, you know, the budget was in deficit. You were worried about what you could afford. Turns out, though, the budget is going to be in surplus, more than $20 billion for that financial year, as the Treasurer has said. Um, is there room for any further relief now that you can see how the size of this surplus? Well, of course, the changes we're making, whether it's to rent assistance, job seeker, are structural changes. They're ongoing increases uh, that will be applied. So when you talk about the surplus from last year, that's a dev very different circumstance to the reforms that we've made, which are ongoing and structural. Now, we have calibrated these to be responsible, to help people that are doing it tough, but also that they are sustainable into the long term. So what do you say to those who uh, no doubt will welcome any sort of increase but still facing these increasing mm -hmm. costs, inflation is still rising, um, will there be any further help this financial year? Well, what we have coming in, of course, is this extra support flowing on the 20th of September. That is, of course, if our bill, our safety net bill, passes the parliament in the next fortnight. Do you so think I, it will, just on that? Well, I'll be urging uh, everyone in the Senate, people need relief now, and I'll be urging the Senate to pass our safety net bill. It is really a matter for the Greens, for the uh, Coalition, for the crossbench of whether that bill gets passed, but we've been pretty clear that we want to provide this support Support. Um, and we that's want, it for this financial year? And we want it flowing from the 20th of September. Um, of course, in addition to that, we have energy relief flowing, which will people will start seeing in their bills from the 1st of July. Of course, the uh, tripling of the bulk billing incentive, um, rent assistance. It is really a pretty wholesome package to cover a number of areas. Let's turn to another aspect of your portfolio. A Senate inquiry into consent laws was held uh, during the week. A consistent theme was the, the complication of different um, legal definitions of consent in different uh, states and territories. Now, harmonising them would help, but I, I suppose only if it's best practice that's being uh, applied. What would you like to see? 
Well, I'd like to see uh, uh, that we do work together with states and territories to see uh, strong consent laws. I think um, that is really important. But we also know that there is a lot of educative work to do out there on what consent means. Um, the research does show that uh, people are confused. People have different interpretations of what consent actually means. And indeed, uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about it. If they can avoid talking about consent, uh, they will. Well, People let's, don't let's know talk how to have it. those conversations with their children either. So this is a big area of need that our country Very needs to tackle for education, but also for laws to be consistent. Well, just on some of those laws, should the age of consent be 16 or 17? Well, look, that is a, absolutely a matter to work through with what's states your, and territories. Well, well when, we, when we're actually talking about consent, actually, what we're actually talking about is a positive conversation that both uh, people um, engaging in sexual intercourse or uh, a, anything, really, any um, uh, intimate activity are actually both willing participants. That's actually the nub of it. It's not the age of uh, necessarily that's where the focus is. When we're talking about so consent... Does that age, does that age matter in law? Well, well, the age matters in law between so what should, jurisdictions. What should, what well, should it be? Well, that, to be honest, that is a matter for states and territories to work through. When we okay. talk about consent, what we're actually talking about is making sure that young people, as well as older people, have a proper understanding about what it means uh, to give consent to intimacy. Are you talking about affirmative consent? Uh, in other words, active consent being given rather than assumed consent? Because... The states differ on this as well. Where, yeah. where do you stand on this? Well, that's something that is actually being discussed at the moment. What's about, your view? What's well, your well I, I, I want to work with states and territories about what that looks like. I think we need strong consent laws, of course. Affirmative well, consent? Well, we, I'm just asking if well, you support well, this. Well, I mean, there's, uh, there's, what, one of the issues around this area is it is a very grey area. Um, and, for example, there's been established uh, situations where uh, a woman's been passed out and uh, someone thinks it's OK than to sexually which assault is why, her. Which is why many argue affirmative consent is important. Yet in states like your own, South Australia, that's not the law as I understand it. Well, they are currently working across the board on reforming their consent and laws as can well. Can you take a position on this? Well, well, I want to work with states and territories. I think, for example, harmonising the laws across the country is critically important. But we need to educate people about this. There is such a poor level of education. Mm. And I'm telling you, milkshake ads, which is what the previous government thought was consent education, it just won't cut it. Well, speaking of education, big focus of those hearings during the week was universities uh, and what's going on. With some shocking numbers. The last national survey found 275 students are sexually assaulted in university settings every week. And that survey was done uh, at the peak of COVID when presumably a lot of students weren't at, uh, uh, on, on campus. Is it time to get some more accurate data about what's going on at universities? Well, I, I do think there needs to be transparency about what's going on at universities and right across the country. A new uh, national survey? Well, look, I, I, I'm going to work with uh, my uh, the education minister to look at what can be done. But Do you want a new national survey? Well, what I want to see is uh, those numbers reduce on campus. I want to see the numbers of sexual assault and sexual I'm harassment. I'm sure everyone does. Should we have the some, some more accurate data? Than well, well, data is key. So a new national survey? Uh, uh, well, data is key uh, to making sure that we can actually deal with the problem. But it's not just about more data. What we need to see, and universities are in a really unique uh, position for this, is actually interventions. Um, interventions to actually ensure that younger people starting uni university have information on consent, understand what sexual assault is. And universities are in a unique position Position. And quite frankly, I don't think universities have been doing enough on well, this. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because before the 2019 election, Labor promised an independent task force to hold universities to account uh, for what's going on with sexual assault and harassment on their campuses. There was the threat of penalties and even withholding funding if they weren't doing enough. Tanya Plibersek said at the time, the time for excuses, the time for talk is over. 
What's happened to that commitment? Well, uh, myself and Jason Clare have been working uh, very closely together on what universities can do. We've now got a new national plan to end violence against women and children, and it's clear that everyone's got to take responsibility, including our universities. Do we need an independent task force, as Labor promised back then? Well, I want to see universities uh, take the responsibility seriously. I want to see them actually intervene to make sure that they're providing education on campus and I want to see them uh, work with the government on this. I know that Minister Clare is very interested in continuing that conversation with universities. Is a task force on the table or is that... Well, well, well I, I will work with Minister Clare on this, but what's really clear is the status quo is not good enough. OK. Final one, uh, Minister. Child protection. One of the Close the Gap targets is reducing the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care. Uh, You've commenced a formal partnership of um, what's called shared decision making with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders on this. Can you explain how that works and how it also might work alongside an Indigenous voice? Yeah, look, for the first time ever, the Ministerial Council on Child Protection, which involves me as the Commonwealth lead, but also every state and territory, agreed to work in a different way to reduce the out-of-home care. Uh, and that is including equal numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders meeting and making decisions with Commonwealth and state ministers co-chaired together. Aboriginal leaders on this uh, have said they finally got hope for the first time that we will implement things like the Indigenous Child Protection uh, Placement Principles. So this is a new way of working, of actually sharing power, and this is an exact example of how the voice would work. Providing advice and, and intel and information. One of the things that's come out from that process is unlike what seems to be in the wider community, this sense that everything the voice uh, every bit of advice the voice will provide will be combative. I, and I know the ministers around the table, have found it really helpful. It has guided what we can do to make a difference and it is going to lead to practical changes on the ground. So this is a really good example of doing things differently, of providing a voice and ensuring that we actually get practical outcomes. Amanda Rishworth, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, coming up, how worried should Australia be about some of the pushback from Republicans in Washington over the idea of sharing Virginia-class nuclear submarines with Australia? We'll get to that, but we're going to continue this conversation. Back to our panel, joined once again by Jennifer Hewitt, Greg Sheridan and Amy Ramikas. Um, look, just on consent laws there, Amy, obviously a, a desire to have harmonised laws between the states and territories, but does it sound to you like the federal government is doing enough to push for change here? Look, I, I watched the hearings and I think it's fair to say that all three senators, so Greens, Larissa Waters, Labor's Nita Green and the Liberals' Paul Scar, were absolutely shocked by what they were hearing, uh, not just about what was happening in universities, which may be its own separate inquiry after right. what came out during those uh, hearings and the testimony, but also just the fact that Harmonising affirmative consent is a good idea. Uh, New South Wales has done it. Victoria is looking at doing it. There's still problems with those laws, but it is a start. But if we do not actually start from the bottom with proper age-appropriate sexual education, more training of everyone involved in the court system and in frontline services, and actually start addressing some of the rape myths that happen across society, changing consent laws is actually not going to do anything other than give a new charge. Yeah, that's the, the affirmative uh, consent issue. Um, there, as I pointed out, though, Labor used to have this policy of, when it comes to universities, having a much tougher cop on the beat, I suppose. There's a lot of focus on universities in this hearing during the week too, wasn't there? And rightly so. And end rape on campus, Australia have done amazing work in Surely this space. Surely the starting point's getting some accurate data, though, because those figures, as I said, they're, they're during COVID... They're not all that reliable. It's not just the survey, though, which the Universities Australia couldn't commit to redoing it. It's actual transparent, real-time reporting by universities of what they're getting from their students. Mm. We don't have that. Universities are very opaque with this, about how many reports they get, the action that they're taking, what they're doing to actually improve it. We actually have universities blocking action. We have universities blocking consent campaigns. We have universities blocking students being able to access help or even 
releasing footage when they have it. There needs to be a stronger look at this. The government actually needs to stop, you know, wishy-washy with this and say this is something we're going to do because students are suffering. And not just people who look like me. If you speak another language, if you're Indigenous, if you come from any sort of disadvantage, you will have a much harder time not just reporting it but accessing help. Universities have got a lot of work to do here. Just uh, before we move on, on Job Seeker, Jennifer, you heard from the Minister there the increase with indexation won't be 40 it'll be $56 a fortnight for those on Job Seeker. The Commonwealth rent assistance increase topped up as well thanks to indexation. Um, there was a lot of debate around this at the time of the budget and they've still got to get the bill through the House, right? The, um, the Libs aren't yet committing to backing it, but where do you think this will go? And is that $56 a fortnight? It sounds a bit better than 40 bucks, right? Well, it certainly sounds better than uh, 40 bucks. On the other hand, you know, you have had inflation. So I'm sure that the Greens will be very keen to point all this out and, and demand more. Uh, at the same time, though, um, you do have the pressures on the budget, the cost. So I think the government can talk about their, their yeah. just targeting relief. Um, to people who need it most and they're, they're doing what they can without adding to inflation. So, yes, it'll be an issue, but it won't be as big of an issue as, I think, more generally for the, for the population in terms of um, cost of living and the fact that we do have, of course, uh, a very, very low unemployment rate still. Let's turn to uh, what's been happening over the last couple of days, the Osmond talks, which were overshadowed to a degree, Greg, by that awful... Uh, helicopter crash on Friday night. Um, look, we, we still don't know a lot of the details about what happened there, but um, you know, everybody's thoughts are obviously with the, the crew, the four crew on board, their families, and the wider defence community that were involved in this. This is a huge military exercise, um, Talisman Sabre. But what do we know about the Taipan helicopter fleet generally? Well, David, uh, first of all, just, you know, can I say, like everyone else, uh, how much we love and admire our servicemen. And, um, you know, they take risks nobody else does. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's no joke. And, and uh, you know, we all feel for them. Look, the Taipan is a disgrace. It ought not to be in service. It is another triumph of the defence acquisition process. It's a dud helicopter. Everybody knows this. Years ago, we announced that we were replacing them with Black Hawks. God alone knows why we still don't have the Black Hawks. Um, Everything moves in defence at an, at an unbelievably slow process. Um, this is just a, another uh, equipment failure. And, you know, the government has just doubled down. It's reappointed all the same people who brought us all the same equipment failures in the past. It's not doing anything uh, to get us new equipment in, in a meaningful time frame. And... Um, uh, this is just kind of what you can expect, really. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we need to stress, we don't know the reason for this particular crash yet, but th there have been problems and concerns about the Taipan. We well, had, we've grounded we had the Taipan time and again. Yeah, we've and one of them grounded. went down earlier this year in, uh, in Jarvis Bay. Fortunately, no one was killed in, in that incident. Um, look, on Osmin, generally, uh, a lot of words came out of the two days of talks between the American and Australian foreign and defence ministers. Look, they, they did agree to um, the missile manufacturing in Australia that was announced earlier this year. The Americans, as I understand it, will uh, agree to purchase a certain amount that makes it viable. Uh, they're going to upgrade our northern bases as well. They're going to do more in space, although it was a little unclear what we're going to do together in, in space. Um, what were the main takeouts? Well, David... Um you know, you've summarised everything brilliantly, but let me offer you this correction. The missile initiative wasn't announced earlier this year. The missile initiative was announced in the Defence Strategic Update of 2020. Mm. And uh, they've announced at Osmin that they think we might begin to manufacture missiles in two years' time. So it never, it never is as quick as they say. So it'll be six years. <laughs> right. You know, in the time that China can conquer the South China Seas three times over and build the equivalent to our Navy six times over we will apparently start manufacturing a missile. Now, the, the Americans haven't actually committed to do anything here. The Secretary of State and Secretary of Defence can't do it. It's, it's up to Congress. And um, in any event, all that's going to happen is that the two companies that supply most of our missiles, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, will hopefully each set up a factory here and start manufacturing stuff. But I understand that all we're going to start with are the HIMARS rockets, these are basically short range. I mean, they're 300 kilometres. You might call them intermediate range. They're, they're artillery pieces. They're modern artillery pieces. 
We have been talking for years and years and years about the need to have long-range missiles which keep enemies at bay. You know, 2,000 kilometre range Tomahawks stationed around northern Australia on our uh, surface fleet, but we don't have a surface the fleet. The HIMARS might be great in Ukraine, but not what we need, is yeah, it? Yeah, we're, we're not going to use a HIMARS in the South China Sea. And uh, we, we don't have a surface fleet. We've got three war, war mm. vessels, the air warfare destroyers, and the government has kicked off to another inquiry any uh, consideration of what we do on our surface fleet. What's happening here is... It's very important at the level of symbolism. It shows the world that the Americans love us. That's great. So any potential adversary has got to take that into account. But in terms of producing our own actual strategic deterrent or capability, this government is doing more or less nothing, which is more or less what the last Well, at the same did. time as these talks were happening, we had something like 23 Republican senators writing, uh, uh, signing up to an open letter, raising concerns about... Well, the key element of the AUKUS deal, uh, sharing Virginia-class submarines with Australia, they want a commitment. While they support that principle, they want more from the Biden administration to top up their own uh, domestic submarine manufacturing. Uh, Lloyd Austin, the Defence Secretary, was asked about this yesterday. And he, look, he sounded pretty open to offering something here. As we uh, uh, embarked upon this endeavour, we're confident that uh, we were placing the, the right amount of investment into uh, the industrial base. But again, uh, uh, we, we will continue to make sure that uh, all the pieces are in place as we proceed, and I have great confidence. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, lots of confidence. How confident should Australia be, or how worried should Australia be about these Republican, this bit of pushback from the Republicans? Yes, well, of course, there's, there's a great deal of bipartisan support for AUKUS in Washington, but, what the, but far greater than that is the uh, absolute bitter by, uh, partisanship uh, over between Republicans, uh, Republicans and Democrats and the fact that the Republicans are going to push the, Demo um, the Biden administration as hard as they can, and that, that is only going to get worse. Mm. Um, as the presidential election um, comes next year. So yeah, I, I think I, I understand the, 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 the reassurance, and I, to, to Greg's point, this is all very symbolic and we all say very nice things. Um, but in the same way that, uh, as Greg's pointed out, you know, Labor very correctly made the point that there was a lot of um, talk from the coalition government about, you know, how we were going to manage this very, very dangerous strategic situation, but there was no delivery. We now seem to be seeing a repeat of this as well. And so you combine that with the fact that in the US, domestic politics is going to be very, very fraught. I think, it, I think the intention's there. It will probably go ahead. It may take time, but it will certainly be very messy. In the meantime, we're trying to thaw relations with China. And as um, my ABC colleague Andrew Green reported during the week, there was some criticism when the Australian Army band showed up at the Chinese embassy uh, for an event to mark the 96th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army. Please stand for the national anthem of the People's Republic of China and the national anthem of the Commonwealth of Australia. <laughs> As the Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie said, our troops shouldn't be used as political props at a celebration for the Chinese Communist Party, especially when the coercive dynamics still at play in the relationship is still there. Um, was, that a, was that a problem? Did anyone think that the army band turning up to... Well, look, it's pretty weird that we're serenading the embassy of a government which is holding Australian citizens on trumped-up charges and indeed threatening to execute Australians... Uh, and is still applying trade embargoes against Australia. But if I can... If you give me one second of indulgence, to go back to the Republicans, what they show you in Congress is we might not get the AUKUS subs. We probably will, but we might not. Even in a best-case scenario, we don't get our first one for 10 years. So we have to do all the other things mm. that we need to do to provide a credible defence force. We're not doing any of that. I mean, that band playing at the Chinese embassy is probably the most proactive military action Australia will ever take <laughs> against the People's Republic of China. <laughs> um, look, j just quickly before we move on, the ambassador at that same event raised the, the idea of resuming some level of military exercise between China and uh, Australia. Uh, just quickly, Greg, good idea? Well, the exercises we used to do with them are quite different from doing an exercise with the Americans where you, you learn how to do things together. 
the exercise you do with the Chinese are the way you learn how not to run into each other at sea. Right. I, again, I just don't see how you can do it while they're holding our citizens hostage. And obviously they're playing us off against the Americans. The Amer they'll never encounter an Australian uh, military uh, asset in their waters because we can't move our assets further than Bugandor anyway. But the, they might run into Americans and they won't do these uh, mm. guardrails or dialogue or anything with the Americans. So they're obviously playing us off to say, look, a reasonable country like Australia, we can do with it, these exercises. I don't see any point in our uh, joining in with that Chinese pantomime. Final one, uh, Amy. The, the government tomorrow or well, the next day is going to announce an inquiry uh, into um, some of these contracts that Home Affairs... Um, uh, well, contract, Home Affairs does contracts with lead contractors and then there's uh, Nick McKenzie in the, in, and others at the Nine newspapers have been reporting in a series of articles this week. It's the contracts they've then done with subcontractors that some of them are looking a little suspect. Uh, there's one in particular, one issue in particular they wrote about where Peter Dutton as Minister was warned by the Federal Police um, about a, a, a businessman who was getting some of these contracts. Uh, then about a month later, he was still awarded a contract and eventually was uh, convicted over uh, paying bribes. Um, is an inquiry a good idea? How worried should Peter Dutton be about this, do you think? Oh, an inquiry is absolutely a good idea and it's well overdue. An inquiry into how Home Affairs spends money, the billions and billions of dollars. Defence and Home Affairs seems to be the only thing that government believes in MMT in which you can just keep printing money just in order to be able to pay for this stuff. The limit does not seem to exist. And how we have treated those contracts with just kind of like, well, we'll just keep throwing money, we're not going to do our due diligence, compared to how we treat people trying to come into this country like the dichotomy just kind of blows my mind I think Peter Dutton will be worried just because he's trying to get from a political point of view uh, cost of living going a bit more uh, momentum in terms of what he's doing on the voice and this is going to bring him back to all of the troubles that happened with the Morrison government politically but from a transparency point of view this is well overdue and we should be having a look at, at further than just what was raised in the in the nine stories we should be looking at that budget completely the the, the, look, the opposition leader's been on leave the last couple of weeks. We'll see what he says. But all of his colleagues were saying during the week, well, it's Home Affairs that signs these contracts, not the Minister. That's long-standing uh, practice here. Uh, Jennifer... Uh, <coughs> Robo-debt. <coughs> well, this is the thing. There's been a lot of inquiries that have found big problems in the life of the, the former government. Is this another one, do you think, that's worth Yes, I, I, do, I do think this is going to... It won't have the same widespread impact, perhaps, that, uh, that robo-debt did, uh, because people could identify with that so clearly, but I think it's going to embarrass the coalition yet again. And to, to Amy's point, that is exactly where they don't want the debate to be at the moment. They want to be focused on cost of living, and that, that is going to be embarrassing. And, of course, you, we, of course it is true that... That Home Affairs does the contracts and everything, but obviously there was something going badly wrong. And in the end, you know, the minister is supposed to be responsible for a department. Home Affairs is sounding, Greg, pretty confident that, yes, things do cost more to deliver in a place like Nauru or Manus Island. Its invoices stack up. The Auditor General had a look at some of this stuff uh, back in 2020. Um, what do you think, though? We're still spending well, a lot of money for these it's, centres. It's hard to operate in countries like Papua New Guinea and Nauru in exactly the same way you do in Australia, which is not to justify any wrongdoing. Um, I think I never was a fan of the Home Affairs model. I thought the separate departments co consulting each other closely is better than centralising everything. There's obviously a campaign to get the head of Home and Affairs, Mike Pizzullo. I've got a terrific solution for them. Why not make Mike Pizzullo the head of defence? where he can smash all the heads together and actually make things happen. I mean, the great... I think it would be a tragedy if we lose Pizzullo because he's a, a public servant who gets more done before morning tea than the rest of the public service does in a year. Does that so mean that it's move him out good of, things that are getting done, well, though? Well, let's move him into defence where he can smash up all the generals and let's disamalgamate Home Affairs into its constituent parts and have ministers consulting with each other. All right, on that note, uh, our panel, Amy Ramekis, Greg Sheridan and Jennifer Hewitt, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures.
I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with satirist for 7.30, Mark Humphreys. And a very warm well welcome. Thank you, Mike. How do you do? I'm, I'm very well, sir. Mark, it's been terrorising us for over a year now, but it looks like the dragon might be finally uh, losing a bit of its firepower. Oh, about time. What are the cartoonists going to do when inflation is finally, you know, dragon's gone from oh. their cartoon. It's either it's either the dragon or it's the rack where they're sort of, you know, stretchy mortgage payers. There needs to be pain involved. Mark Knights, uh, he does do a good dragon, I must say. He's a great dragon. He's drawer. got the RBA, former RBA governor now, um, passing under a low bridge. <laughs> Look at me. I'm getting this inflation dragon under control. Yeah. No one survives the Montague Street Bridge. This has captured the moment before it just wipes him out. Yeah. Brett Lethbridge. Oh, look. Um, hey, oh, there we go. We've stretching. Got the rack. Yeah, he got the rack. Hands up. Who wants some good news? <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> I love, I actually just love the physicality here. There's something in the stance of the torturer. There's a little bit, a little bit of just belly fat bulb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good yeah. Detail. He, he even looks like he's had enough of torture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? that's it. Uh, David Pope has drawn him as a, not water bombing plane in this terms, but a uh, benzene dropping plane. The RBA governor no. as, as a Hercules. No, no, but I mean, where's the dragon? Attention, that inflation front from the Northern Hemisphere seems to be easing. Please stand by while we contemplate a final fuel dump before returning to land. I love the eyes peering out here. Peering out through the sort of burnt <laughs> house. We've, we've survived. <laughs> Boom. Oh dear. I love this technique of cartoonists where it sort of shows something that's been sort of temporarily not quite resolved, but there's been some some sort of uh, yeah. progress, and then the, just a reminder in the background of everything else that hasn't been addressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. What have we got? War, commodity prices, supply chains, profit gouging. Yeah, it never ends. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, there have been concerns about on-water matters for many years. Now it's uh, off-water matters. <laughs> Fiona Kataskis goes to the marketing level. The second slogan's much more honest, but it doesn't go well with the focus <laughs> groups. It's stop the boats. Start the abuses, lies, cruelty, secret deals and eye-watering public expense. This is another fantastic Truth one. in advertising. Yeah, I mean, if, if nothing else, at least we stopped the three-word slogan. <laughs> Matt Golding, uh, what sort of return are we hoping to get for the billions we spend? One million dollars. How much is it we've spent? I think it was nine, but it's hard to keep track. It's extraordinary, really, when you think about where all this money sort of goes. Meanwhile, you had a government that was chasing people down with robo-debt. Mark with climate records being smashed around the world, it's uh, definitely the hot topic. Oh yes, all right, we've got a climate scientist here uh, in Megan Herbert's cartoon. Yep. This goes against all my principles, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And um, she's channeling uh, Barbie and Ken here. Well, I mean, you, you know, if you are a climate scientist, you would probably be just clutching at straws, just whatever you can do to get the message through. We are running out of time. It's too hot. <laughs> no new oil, I guess. We seem to be barbecuing the world. Yeah, totally. Uh, lovely Kathy Wilcox here. Business as usual canoe with no paddle. What's the panic? It's all the way up the other end of the boat. It's governments like John West. It's the coal mines that they reject that make their coal mines the best. That's the difference, okay? It's Matt Bissett Johnson, he's got Captain Very Cooked here. Just wait till you uh, 250 years and see what we do. Think this is bad, you're gonna love what we do to the climate. Yes, that's quite, yes, exactly quite literal. They are going to cook islands, yes. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. I'll, uh, I'll let you do the honours. Oh, thank you, Mike. Well, uh, back to you, David Spears. Thank you, Mark Humphreys, and thank you, Mike Bowers. Let's get some final observations. Amy, to you first. Uh, it is not something that's making a lot of news, and it should, but 38 women have been killed this year in family and domestic violence, including uh, nine in 16 days. And while we talk about big national emergencies, this is one that just keeps getting swept under the rug. Yeah, shocking numbers. Greg. So, David, um, my obsession with the defence debate, we don't get our first nuclear sub for 10 years. We won't have a fleet of them until the mid-2050s at the earliest, probably the 2060s. Yet Angus Houston told us these are the most dangerous strategic circumstances in his lifetime. We need to ask the government, we need a new defence debate. We're spending all of our energy on the AUKUS subs, which are going to have no relevance to the security emergencies we face in the next 10 years. We need a new defence debate about what's happening in the next 10 years. Jennifer. Well, for all the attention on Parliament returning this week, most people's attention will actually be hap what's happening at the Reserve Bank on Tuesday mm -hmm. and whether or not they'll uh, decide to raise rates, like uh, Jim Chalmers. Um, I hope that uh, they're, they're done and they won't raise rates and the market thinks that's more likely now. Uh, but we've all been wrong before. <laughs> yeah, look, you're right, though. We'll all be focused on that on Tuesday. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally... 
It's an old diplomatic cliche, but it's certainly had a good workout lately. How do you tell an ally your best friends without upsetting all your other besties? We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. There are no closer friends than Australia and New Zealand. We can stand here hand on heart and say that Australia at this moment has no better friend than America. There is no closer friend than we have in the there are no greater friends than Australia and Papua New Guinea. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.